Hello and welcome to this first episode on near-death experience. This may be the last episode too, we'll see how it goes, depending on how much we have to talk about. So let me know if everything's coming through okay. Just send me a quick hello. I'll just make sure that it's streaming through the platforms. So just waiting a few minutes, making sure that everything is coming through. In the meantime, I'll get a couple of my notes ready here. So what we're going to do today is I'll share my own experience of what's been called a near-death experience. All right, looks like it's coming through now. Gita, hello, Janelle. And this is interesting because I found out maybe about a year ago or so that one of the experiences I had qualifies as a near-death-like experience. So some experiences are called near-death experiences themselves. And those typically are associated with bodily death or near bodily death. So for example, a person undergoing CPR or a person um, experiencing some kind of traumatic event, maybe it's a drowning, maybe it's a shooting, any kind of event where the physical body is dying or about to die is one of the characteristics of this near death experience. And the near death like experiences are times in which the physical body is not actually under threat. All right, so one such experience I had, I learned qualifies as near-death-like experience. So we're going to look at that and see perhaps what some of its implications could be. So why am I sharing this now? This occurred maybe about 15 years ago or so in my late 20s. Um, a couple reasons I haven't talked about it much so far. One was that I, the framework I'd grown up in or the culture I had grown up in was one that said, yes, these kinds of experiences happen and, you know, almost that they're no big deal, right? This is kind of part of how the mind develops and it's a natural aspect of its development. Sometimes it's very dramatic. Sometimes it's more subtle and drawn out, um, but that one can kind of um, perhaps easily get lost in these experiences as well. So because of that kind of background, I haven't talked about it much and I myself didn't think about it as a discrete event because it seems to be something that's ongoing right now. It's not like there was an end to it, right? So the very idea that there is something like a near death experience with brackets around it, that's something that didn't fit with my view. And personally, I also didn't really associate it with death in any way. Although we will see that there is some association, it didn't really seem like it was about death. It's simply the development of the mind or the opening of the mind. So hello, Rihanna and Kazim, Melissa, hello. So for these reasons, I haven't talked about it much, but I'm seeing that there are some very important benefits to talking about it, namely, one is that these kinds of experiences are happening all the time to people. You know, we may have recorded just a few thousand or so, but experiences that are called either near death or mystical or spiritual or enlightening, these kinds of experiences are happening all the time to different extents, different intensities. And I think bringing them out in the public is important to show that what we think of as a world and what we think of as possible is is just a fraction perhaps of what is actually possible. That's one reason. The other reason, and so a key part of that is that these experiences are in a sense, they're democratized, right? You don't have to be spiritual to have these mystical type experiences. A person doesn't have to be religious. You don't have to be good at science. You don't have to be good at art. There's no category. You don't have to be young or old. There's no category that can essentially contain broader experiences of life, right? And I think that is really important today when there is this 
talk about science and spirituality. You know, science is the way, you no know, spirituality is the way, you no, know, you know, introspection is the way. All of these are our own ideas, our own brackets around certain aspects of being human. And nature as it is, if we may call this nature, nature doesn't care much for our brackets. Nature doesn't care much for the way that we restrict our experience and name our experience. And so I think that's really refreshing to see how these kinds of events are happening all the time in different ways for different people. The other thing is that when we analyze these experiences, we see that they are very interdisciplinary, right? So for me, it touched on the way I bracket it, the way I categorize certain things, makes it touch on anatomy, medicine, physics, philosophy, perception, thought, identity, and basically all of these different fields, psychology, and importantly, what we think of as mental illness and mental health, these kinds of experiences are interdisciplinary because they make us, they force us out of these boundaries, right? So Rihanna says, no brackets allowed, exactly. So Sheila, just talking about this with friends yesterday, wonderful. So for these reasons, these conversations are really important. So with that, I'm just reading some of the comments here, okay. So with that, let's share this experience. So this was in my late 20s when I was in medical school and it was toward the latter part of medical school. It was a time that I was back home on a break and I was in my room reading something. So there's nobody else in the room. It was just myself and I was reading um, philosophy as it happens to be. I think it was entirely coincidental in some sense that it was philosophy it really could have been anything but what happened was while reading this something caught my interest and when i focused on that you know that intensity of focus came then the experience was one of a explosion right there was a sudden and quite dramatic explosion this is I should say kind of in retrospect, right? And at the time, I'm not sure that I could have expressed this or would have qualified it in these ways. But for now, it's a sudden dramatic explosion. And the, the physicalized world, the kind of crystallized world that was being experienced is kind of shattered, right? It's blown to smithereens in a sense. And so if you look around you now in the room that you're in, you'll probably, if you're, especially if you're indoors, you'll probably be angles, right? It's kind of like this crystallized structure. So this seemed to, in my experience, explode and just kind of be blown up. And what remained was this light, right? This tremendous blaze of light, this tremendous blazing, let's say. And in fact, that was all that was there. There was nothing other than this blaze of deep orange saffron kind of light, right? So there was still some experience of individual identity, right? There was still some experience of what we call me. And yet there is no clear boundary between what this is, what this identity is and this blaze. And it was simply this. In some ways, there's not really much to say because there was simply this blaze and no real sense of boundary. There were no distinctions. There were no other beings, right? So in many near-death type experiences, people see certain prophets or hear what they call the voice of God or experience many different things. Here it was just, just this. And it was timeless. There was no, I can't say how long this happened, right? That idea of length is not there because length can only be there when there is a distinct sense of boundary, right? What we call time is the experience of the interval between two successive points, right? So if you wanna, you have one point, 
and then you shift attention, that interval is what is experienced as time. Shifting attention here, then shifting attention here. And so to experience time, there has to be interval. And to experience interval, there have to be two, right? But when this there's no clear boundary between one and another or something and something else, then time is not experienceable, right? So this is what people sometimes call timelessness or people sometimes call, um, what is it called? Eternity. All right. So there's this blaze. And at some point, there is the feeling of wanting to go beyond this, right? So when this happens, when this sense of identity is now being pushed beyond this, then a reminder comes up, right? It's almost like within this blaze, this reminder flashes up. And it's instilled then in the mind that if this happens, then it would not be fair, right? That there is still such and such to do. A, B, C, there's still things to do, right? There's still stuff that has to happen. And so if this process continues, whatever it is that is happening, then that those things can't happen and it wouldn't be fair. So this was kind of like a suggestion, right? It wasn't like a command or, or a, something dramatic, but the suggestion was put out there and it felt true. And so because it felt true and it felt sincere and plain and naked, it caused hesitation in this process, right? So the sense of identity. So I then felt, oh, almost like, let me think about that. Let me consider this, right? So in this moment, as this process was, let's say, nearing completion or going beyond a certain boundary, going beyond the end of this. At that point, this hesitation caused everything to re-implode, right? So that the very doubt was the impetus to cause everything to, everything to re-implode. And in that moment, everything came back almost as to where it was before. So the experience then again was of identity being associated with the body and being back in this room, right? The room in a sense reformed, right? So there are many ways to interpret this. We can say that the sense of identity left the body, went somewhere else and then came back, or it could be depending on how we identify with our identity and the world, whether it's from a first mind or second mind perspective, it could be that the world itself recrystallized in a sense. So regardless of how we put this together, the experience was one of the identity going beyond the body and associating with something else. It's not that the body is not relevant. It's not that the room was not relevant, but it was simply seeing a much more complete picture of what is here, right? An expansiveness that is all encompassing, someone says. Yes, all right. So now when the world and the local sense of identity recrystallizes, so to speak, now things are different in the sense that perception and thinking have changed, right? So whereas perception before was something that is happening within the body, right? The local organs of perception, such as the eyes and the nose and such, while they are receiving stimuli from an external world, this is the first mind perspective, what's changed is that the body itself and the organs of perception themselves are perceptions, right? So rather than organs of perception creating perception, the organs themselves become modified processes of perception. The body itself becomes a process of perception. The sense of local identity itself becomes a process of, you can say, perception or conception, right? So this very, the mechanism and the locus of where thinking and experiencing and being happens 
changes. Right, so this happens to different extents depending on what kind of near-death people, what kind of experience people have had, right? So now ensues, after this, now comes the process of kind of reintegrating, right? So a process has started now in which the way of perceiving and thinking and being and experiencing identity and experiencing what we call the world has changed. And yet now it's not as it was during the peak of that experience, because now the world has kind of reformed in a sense. And now comes the process of either living in one world or the other, right? In one world, it's the world of multiplicity. There's many, and it's the ongoing story, right? It's the popular story in society. But in another world, there is very little to no distinction, right? And neither, neither of these in and of themselves is actually helpful in my view, right? So from where I was, I had to integrate these two. And so over many years through emergency medicine residency, through practicing emergency medicine, even after training and through all of life's experiences, being married, having a child, all of these were used, were necessary part of this integration process, right? And this integration process then of reconciling these two experiences, which were no longer one or the other, right? I couldn't just ignore one experience and say, well, that's multiplicity over there, nor could I experience one or label one and say, well, that's, that's oneness or that spirituality over there. There was no longer the option to keep these two different because now they had kind of overlaid, right? So it's almost like tracing paper, right? So, you know, when you want to trace a drawing on one side or on one piece of paper, you have very distinct boundaries and you have very distinct objects, uh, drawings, people. And then on the other hand, you have this tracing paper and the trace paper itself there's nothing on it. It's translucent, right? But now when you overlay these, there's a little bit of both, right? It's neither completely translucent, no light, but neither is it completely a boundary, completely opaque. And so that experience and finding a way to talk about that, to reconcile that, to reconcile that with everything, whether it's philosophy or science or anatomy or daily life, or love, marriage, finding a way to reconcile it with everything is this ongoing process of communicating. It's where the three minds framework is being developed. All of this is from not just that experience, but all the experiences that happened prior to that, right? All of the the investigating, the thinking, the modeling that I had done prior to that along with this intense experience and then everything that came after it all right so nancy says i like the overlaid comment all right melissa says when you experience near death some are shown what is real how life on earth is not all that exists right so Someone says, listen to Yuji Krishnamurti on his shock moment. Result is everything is the same, all one stable, infinite. Yes. So these are all different ways of talking about it, right? Some people talk about, um, what is it? I guess Yuji Krishnamurti talked about a shock experience. Some people talk about getting struck by lightning. Some people talk about Kundalini awakening. Some people talk about psychosis. Some people talk about, let's see, in the world, but not of it, and so on, right? This is one of the reasons it's so important that everybody's going to talk about it. Some people call it near-death experience, right? And so on. You can probably list, if everybody lists, there'll be so many different ways to describe it. So Pratima says an unbiased explanation. Hope you have come across from Tom Campbell. Same without any add-ons from religious perspective, right? So Tom Campbell will talk about it. I think he's the physicist. He'll talk about it strictly from physics. Remember, physics 
itself is also an add-on. Every way that we categorize this and talk about it is an add-on. Unfortunately, in our culture, it's typically talked about as spiritual or mystical. But it's really none of it. It's simply an experience. And the way the frames that we bring to it are the different disciplines that we have. This is the important thing that I'm trying to get across. All right. Um, someone says, I've had two NDAs, 18 and 33. They've changed my entire outlook. Yes. So these experiences tend to change the entire outlook. They tend to cross disciplines. They tend to happen to pretty much anybody. And another major point to bring up is that, in a sense, it is happening now for everyone, right? So these experiences are not, somebody Somebody said this is. this shows that there is life beyond earth or beyond this. Yes, of course there is. However, we don't have to, there doesn't have to be a dramatic or intense experience to recognize this. First of all, this is talked about in all cultures, in all any kind of indigenous culture, some variation of this will be talked about, right? Secondly, the reason that we are not perceiving this now, that all of us are not perceiving this now, is simply because the way in which our attention has been trained, right? All infants will have the ability to recognize what this is about, right? Because they're their attention has not yet been trained in a particular way, right? I'm not saying that the way infants see the world is the way to see it. That's not what I'm saying. But there is definitely a benefit to not being locked into our constructs and locked into the patterns through which we use our attention, okay? We need patterns. We need constructs. Otherwise, there would be no conversation right now and we couldn't share the story. At the same time, there's a difference between using these constructs and being locked into them. When we're locked into a construct, we're also locked into a particular way of perceiving, a particular way of thinking, a particular way of seeing, and a particular way of experiencing our own identity. And so as you look right now, to make it very simple and very naked, as you look right now and you're seeing perhaps this screen in front of you, there is a way in which attention is being used so that you're seeing this screen in the way that you're seeing it, right? And this is something that we just don't talk about in our society, right? There's a particular focus to the gaze that is associated with a particular sense of identity, which is associated with where the attention is placed, where in relationship to the body in space that attention is placed, which is also associated with the intensity of that attention and the duration of that intention. And only when all of these variables come together in a particular way, do you and I see the screen in front of us? And do you and I not see whatever else might be here? Just like a very simple example is that to see this screen, your attention cannot be, for example, to the side over there, right? If my attention is to the side over there, I can't see the screen, right? That's just the way attention works. In addition, even if I'm looking at the screen, if my focus is on looking through the screen or behind the screen, then I won't see the screen because my focus is different. In addition, even if my focus is here, at least physically, if the mind is thinking of something else, I again won't see the screen, right? So you can see in such a very simple example, to even see the screen, our attention has to be molded in so many ways. And what I'm saying is simply a different molding, a simple, a different configuration of attention, which is what I call the second mind in the three minds framework. A simple change in the configuration of attention and which goes along with identity is what opens up the view beyond this kind of physicalized, multiplicitous, discrete world, all right? And from this perception, to go back to what somebody said earlier, right? Somebody said earlier that there's um, something beyond earth or the afterlife and these kinds of experiences. From this perspective, from the second mind perspective, there is no distinction really between what we call life and death, 
right? Because life and death obviously pertain in our culture, in the world culture, it pertains to the movement of the body. Movement of the body is called life. Stoppage of the movement of the body is called death. In fact, that's how we diagnose death, right? You look for no corneal reflex means that there is no movement. You look for the movement of the heart, there's no movement of the heart. That means that's also associated with death. Even when we talk about brain death, we look for movement, electrical activity. So where there is no movement in the physical body is what we call death. But of course, if we look closely, we will see that even that body is changing. It's what we call decomposing. So there is some movement. And furthermore, the identity is not restricted to the body. So either we say life continues beyond death, or we say that we are dead now. <laughs> you bring death into life, or you bring life into death. Either way, the brackets of both destroy each other. So what's important to me, because I've been talking about this NDE more in the last few weeks, in the last few months, what's important to me in sharing this is not so much to suggest that these amazing experiences happen to a few people, but rather that these experiences that can be transformative are happening right now beyond the boundary of how we have been trained to use our attention right? And this moves beyond the idea of physicality being primary. It moves into the idea of space and experiences being frames of mind. Another limited way to say it, but at least hopefully it's a way that opens up new perspectives. All right. So somebody mentioned uh, best near dis near the experience, heard of Anita Morjani. Yes, so I think she had an experience, many people have an experience of severe illness or near death precipitating this and then also followed by healing, right? So an experience of dramatic healing that happens afterwards. Our loved ones are not lost to us with reincarnation. So again, in examining this, all notions of uh, reincarnation or life after death or physical and mental or space, what space is, or the notion of time, different frames of time, or the notion of mental health and mental illness, all of these now come into play. And if we take these experiences as valid to investigate, now we have we are forced to break down some of these barriers. All right. So I'll stop with that for now. There are many things to say about this. Um, integration is another one. So for me, it so happened that this, so afterwards, this period of integration, which lasted more than a decade or so, it now becomes this process of not being able to go to one place or the other, right? It's all happening right here. So how do we integrate this? How do we talk about this? And that was this intense process that lasted many, many years. And for me, one of the, one of the great things that was fortunate for me was that there was a framework. I had heard about all this stuff a lot. And I'd also heard that in some ways it's no big deal, it happens. And I'd also been around tons of people growing up who had been through some kind of similar experience, right? So even though initially it, it didn't really register, oddly enough, as something that dramatic because that kind of window open and close and the focus was on integrating what was happening now, still having that previous framework, having that culture that normalized it, and having people around even afterwards that didn't really think much of it, that understood it, had experienced it decades ago, had integrated all of it, all of this makes such a tremendous difference, right? Because that allows the creative mind then to then come in and start mapping and finding meaning and frameworks, which is all of the communicating that's happening, right? But it's easy if you don't have that to, number one, think this is weird. Number two, think that this is something very unique and very special, 
Uh, number three, to think that is something pathological, that there is something wrong, right? Because now the physical and the mental have, the categories have evaporated, so to speak. And so because, and also to have time, right? So after this, when I started communicating about this, I started shifting my time to communicating more and being in clinical medicine less so that I could even this out. So in doing all this, this is a process of healing, of bringing all of this together, of communicating, and of finding a way to integrate everything. But if this is not there, if this kind of supportive environment or the understanding of this in a broader framework is not there, it can easily be pathologized or made strange or be something that we tuck away and do not integrate into our lives because it challenges our idea of spirituality being special or of my religion being better than your religion or my science understands everything and, and your science or your philosophy and your reasoning is not. These kinds of ideas have to get demolished if we want to integrate this experience. So this is a little bit about near-death experience and the experience I had. If you have questions, feel free to post them here or you can contact me through the website here. Um, the, the association, you know, IANS is the International Association for Near-Death Studies, IANS.org is an organization that studies all this. I, this all got precipitated because they asked me to speak. And so I've been talking about this more. You can check them out. If you want to read about this, there's a website called nderf.org, nderesearchfoundation.org. And they just have tons of stories from people who have experienced similar type experiences. So you can read those and you'll see that they all have some common threads that at least show us that there is more than what we call this physical world. All right, I will see you, if not next Tuesday, the Tuesday after, and we'll continue this conversation.